United States. An overwhelming 77% of adults polled by the Washington Post and ABC News don't think Congress is doing enough to prevent mass shootings. A majority, 62%, don't think President Trump is doing enough. But when states act faster than the feds, the results are sometimes mixed. In California, for instance, we have a law that bans the possession of high-capacity magazines. But according to law enforcement sources, no one has turned in one of these magazines. On a scorecard tracking the strength of state laws, the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence gives Florida, cited the horrible Parkland school shooting, an F. The group concludes that, quote, consistently we see a powerful correlation. States with stronger laws have fewer gun deaths per capita, while states with weaker laws have more gun deaths. Over half a dozen states get A's, including Maryland, where there's a universal background check for all handgun and assault weapons purchases or transfers. But Maryland's strong gun laws didn't stop this Clarksburg High School student from building an arsenal with an AR-15, other guns, and multiple grenades. Police say he also had a list of grievances. If a determined criminal wants to do harm, they do harm. And if you have a state banning a rifle just because of the way uh, the the rear hand is holds the rifle. Uh, I mean, that's just ridiculous. The White House says President Trump is open to beefing up the National Instant Criminal Background Check, or NICS, but the administration is just as alarmed by the FBI's failures. When you're able to have a specific troubled individual that the community is focused on, that law enforcement is focused on, how come nobody can take action? So that's another area sort of outside the background check system that we're also looking at. As protests continue and new gun laws are discussed, not all elected officials are voting based on the emotion of what happened last week in Florida. Because in Florida, late this afternoon, the state legislature voted not to pursue a new ban on assault rifles. Brett? Peter, thank you. On to other news, Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee are launching a new offensive tonight regarding alleged surveillance abuse during the 2016 election that goes beyond the FBI and the Justice Department. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harridge has the latest tonight. With this letter to current and former intelligence, law enforcement, and State Department officials, the Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee launched phase two of the committee's Trump dossier investigation. Chairman Devin Nunes posed a string of dossier-related questions covering when officials learned the DNC and Clinton campaign paid for the research by former British spy Christopher Steele, as well as how the dossier was used to secure one or more surveillance warrants. Fox News has learned the questionnaire, including a threat to subpoena information, went to former FBI Director James Comey, former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, and former CIA Director John Brennan, among others. The Republican staff memo released earlier this month said the FBI and Justice Department knew about the dossier's Democratic roots when it asked the National Security Court 18 days before the 2016 election to collect Trump campaign aide Carter Page's communications. Almost a year later, Brennan testified he still didn't know the whole dossier story. Director Brennan, do you know who commissioned the Steele dossier? I don't. Do you know if the Bureau ever relied on the Steele dossier as, any, as part of any court filings? applications, petitions, pleadings. I have campaign chairman Paul Manafort, Gates was indicted on money laundering charges by the special counsel. A White House spokesman said the lawyer's guilty plea is many steps removed from the special counsel's collusion mandate. This has to do with an attorney representing uh, one of the individuals who's already been indicted, has nothing to do with actions related to this president. Court observers speculate the guilty plea places more pressure on Gates to cut a deal and cooperate with the special counsel against Manafort. Under sentencing guidelines, Vander Swan faces up to five years in prison and a $250 $50,000 fine, but due to his cooperation, it could be six months in prison and a fine not to exceed $10,000. His sentencing is scheduled for early April. Brett. Okay, Captain, thank you. You're welcome. President Trump is burying the political hatchet with a former rival for now. The president tweets, quote, Mitt Romney has announced he's running for the Senate from the wonderful state of Utah. He will make a great senator and worthy successor to Orrin Hatch and has my full support and endorsement. Romney responded via Twitter saying, thank you, Mr. President, for the support. I, ha I hope that over the course of the campaign, I also earn the support and endorsement of the people of Utah. Obviously, in the past, it's not been that 
nice between the two. Romney's called the president a phony before. Mr. Trump has called Romney, uh, said he choked like a dog in the 2012 presidential race. We'll see how that moves forward. President Trump is also urging Republicans in Pennsylvania to fight a new congressional district map drawn up by the Democrat-controlled state Supreme Court. The redrawing of that map could have big implications for the midterm elections and is seen now as a big win for Democrats. Senior correspondent Eric Sean tells us where things stand right now. Pennsylvania Republicans charge the fix is in after the state Supreme Court redrew the Keystone State's congressional districts. But Democrats say the court's move simply erases a current map that has long unfairly favored the GOP. The court found by a four to three ruling, the current map was, quote, aimed at achieving unfair partisan gain. But the new map cuts the number of districts that President Trump won from 12 to 10 and increases the number of districts that Hillary Clinton could have won by two. That prompted President Trump to tweet, quote, hope Republicans in the great state of Pennsylvania challenge the new push congressional map all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. Your original was correct. Don't let the Dems take elections away from you so that they can raise taxes and waste money. The state's Republican chairman, Val DiGiorgio, says he will challenge the new map in court. This is a blatant power grab by a Supreme Court that seems hell-bent on drawing more Democrat seats as opposed to applying with the Constitution. And all Americans, certainly all Pennsylvanians, should be concerned about uh, this overreach by the courts. DiGiorgio says only legislatures, not courts, can redraw district lines. But Democrats praise the ruling, saying it eliminates gerrymandering like this district, nicknamed Goofy, kicking Donald Duck. Was the old map tilted? It was. It was very tilted. Election expert Michael Lee of the Brennan Center for Justice says the new map does create a more even playing field. Somebody put their thumb on the scale in a pretty heavy way. Um, you know, that's just not very natural in a state like Pennsylvania. Um, you know, this is Pennsylvania, in other words, isn't Nebraska where you've got like dark red areas and, and things like that. It's not Utah. Um, this is a state that's a classic battleground and that you would expect to be very competitive. It just wasn't under the old map. Democrats, he notes, also draw congressional districts that favor them, like in Maryland. But as a result of the ruling in Pennsylvania, he says Democrats there could go from holding five seats now to almost doubling that number. Brett? Eric, thank you. Democrats and Republicans are crowing about their January fundraising numbers. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee says it took in $9.35 million for its best January ever. The National Republican Congressional Committee says it pulled in $10.1 million, the best January in an election year. The Republican National Committee, the RNC, says it raised $12.4 million in January and nearly $145 million overall in the 2017-2018 cycle. We're still awaiting the DNC numbers for January as well. Stocks, not too good today. They were down across the board. The Dow lost 255. The S&P 500 fell 16. The Nasdaq dropped 5. Up next, the North Korean defector's amazing escape. Senior Pentagon officials say Defense Secretary James Mattis will make his recommendation about transgender people serving in the U.S. military to President Trump either today or tomorrow. Defense officials are not saying what Mattis will recommend. They say future announcements will come from the White House. Last year, President Trump called for a ban on transgenders in the military. The president made a very big deal of a North Korean defector during his State of the Union speech last month. Tonight, senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott talks with a man who took his own long and harrowing trip to freedom. Hitting hard at the brutality of North Korea under the regime of Kim Jong-un. It's a new strategy of the Trump administration in its efforts against Pyongyang. And its new weapon is the North Korean defector Ji Sung Ho, the human face of the horror. North Korea is the kingdom of evil. We are joined by one more witness to the ominous nature of this regime. Xi was singled out by President Trump in his State of the Union address last month. He defiantly held up crutches he once used. He lost a leg and a hand in an accident in 1996, struggling to stay alive in North Korea. 
Ten years later, when famine, hardship, and persecution were too unbearable, he swam to freedom, crossing a river from North Korea to China, almost drowning in the process. Even if I had just one day, I wanted to live as a human being outside of North Korea. Bravery cited, he would later meet with the president in the White House, with Vice President Pence during his trip to South Korea. Even recently hugging Fred Warmbier, the father of the American student who died after being held captive in North Korea. It was a victory against North Korea, a victory against evil. Xi runs an organization in Seoul, helping defectors out of the North and reaching those inside. North Korean state media has made threatening statements about him, branding him, quote, human scum. As for recent moves by South Korea to engage with the North through Olympic diplomacy, including meetings with the sister of Kim Jong-un, Xi Sung-ho has concerns. He knows from tough experience. I think that North Korea has a hidden side. I think this is just a show. Defector Xi says any future conversations the South or even the U.S. has with North Korea must deal not only with the regime's nukes and missiles, but with human suffering there as well. Washington seems to agree. Brett. Greg, thank you. The Trump administration is preparing for its first transfer of a detainee from Guantanamo Bay. A Saudi man is set to be moved out of the detention facility and returned to his homeland following a plea agreement with the U.S. military. The prisoner pleaded guilty to a planning a 2002 terrorist attack on a French oil tanker off the coast of Yemen that killed one crew member. He agreed to testify against other al-Qaeda detainees accused of the USS coal bombing and attacks on U.S. troops in Afghanistan in exchange for his transfer home. A top Syrian opposition figure says government forces, along with Iran and Russia, are committing a new holocaust in rebel-held suburbans, su suburbs rather, of Damascus. A monitoring group says more than 100 people have been killed in each of the past two days. Rebels are calling on the UN Security Council for help. Up next, how the Russians are trying to take advantage of the Florida school massacre. First, beyond our borders tonight, Israeli police say Benjamin Netanyahu's former spokesman tried to bribe a judge to drop a fraud case against the prime minister's wife. Last week, you may remember, police recommended Benjamin Netanyahu be charged in a corruption scandal. The prime minister has denied all accusations of wrong, wrongdoing. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is calling for an international peace conference with key goals of full UN membership for what he calls the state of Palestine and a time frame for resolving all issues with Israel for a two-state solution. Abbas appeared before the UN Security Council today and said future peace efforts cannot be brokered by the U.S. U.S. Ambassador to the UN Nikki Haley reiterated the U.S. is ready to work with Palestinian leadership. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is offering to meet with President Trump for direct talks. Maduro tweets the American leader should change what Maduro calls his agenda of aggression for one of dialogue. Today, Venezuela becomes the first country to launch its own version of Bitcoin cryptocurrency to try to work its way out of a major economic crisis we've reported here on Special Report many times. Just some of the other stories beyond our board. Russia is once again tonight being accused of interfering in American domestic affairs. This time, it's the national conversation over gun control sparked by last week's school shooting in Florida. Fox News media analyst and host of Fox's Media Buzz, Howard Kurtz, tells us how the Russians are trying to turn the tragedy to their advantage. It was just an hour after the Florida school shooting that Twitter erupted with such hashtags as gun control now, gun reform now, AR-15 and parkland shooting. And we now know that hundreds of such posts came from Twitter accounts suspected of having links to Russia. In fact, the New York Times reports today this Russian social media blitz is part of a far reaching disinformation campaign that includes conspiracy videos on YouTube phony interest groups on Facebook, and so-called bots that can drive a Twitter discussion and push it into the mainstream media. Analysts say a divisive subject like gun control is fertile ground for these covert Russian operatives whose goal is to fuel conflict and frustration in America. What they're trying to do is foment dissension and anger. They're really trying to get Americans to point fingers at one another, to drive wedges, and double down on fissures that exist in our society. Special Counsel Robert Mueller 
Mueller highlighted the problem last week with indictments against 13 Russians for cyber hacking and trying to disrupt the presidential campaign. These Russians are alleged to have covertly organized political rallies in the U.S. Days after the election, Mueller charges, they coordinated one New York rally, quote, to show your support for President-elect Trump, and another called, Trump is not my president. In the case of protesting NFL players, the Russians took their cue from the president's criticism by pushing such hashtags as boycott NFL and stand for our anthem, as well as take a knee. After the Russian bots whipped up gun control sentiment in the wake of the Florida shooting, they moved on to the hashtag false flag, pushing an outlandish conspiracy theory that students had rehearsed their actions in advance and the tragedy never happened. A year of heavy media coverage fostered the impression that Russian hackers were mainly interested in putting Donald Trump in the White House. It's now clear that Russian propaganda and disinformation are a constant fact of life, even, or perhaps especially, when Americans are being killed. Brett? Howie, thanks. President Trump is denying an allegation that he forcibly kissed a woman in the lobby of his office building in 2006. The Washington Post reports a secretary named Rachel Crooks says Mr. Trump kissed her for about two minutes. The president tweeted today that the incident never happened and how could it with all the security cameras throughout Trump Tower. Crooks responded to reporters saying she would like the security camera footage released. Tonight we begin a three-part Regulation Nation series by looking at the Trump administration's rollback of many Education Department policies. Correspondent Doug McElway tells us there is a lot of red tape to cut through. I am challenging my cabinet to find and remove every single outdated, unlawful, and excessive regulation currently on the books. Few federal agencies impose greater bureaucratic burdens on the interests they oversee than the Department of Education, created by President Carter and the Democratic Congress in 1979. Even the New York Times at the time editorialized against it, saying education, quote, will continue to do better without a central bureaucracy. <laughs> More than 30 years later, the Department of Education has fundamentally changed education, especially higher education. Since 1996, college tuition has skyrocketed 200%, far beyond inflation and in most consumer services. We literally have not just more administrators than faculty, there are more administrators than there are personnel at universities doing teaching, uh, research, and service. And they're all getting paid decent salaries, so as a result, uh, costs go way up. The payoff graduation rates have declined. Now 59% among students seeking a four-year degree, lower still for minorities. And student loan defaults are soaring, an issue the administration tried to tackle when it proposed capping student loan payments at 12.5% of income and forgiving the debt after 15 years. To us and to the American public, regulations are actually the public protections we depend on. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos has begun rescinding many federal mandates for higher education, but has also tried to tackle the issue in lower education, often to intense opposition. Gone under the Trump administration, Michelle Obama's school lunch program. Chocolate milk is back. Also gone, accountability programs like No Child Left Behind and the Race to the Top. Transgender bathroom guidance has been cut. And most controversial, DeVos has withdrawn college Title IX standards for sexual misconduct, believing it denied the accused fundamental due process. We're in the midst of the Me Too moment. People are paying a lot of attention to sexual violence and harassment. And so it seems a surprising choice. Courts appear to be vindicating DeVos and her push for due process. Now those students are suing and the universities are losing sometimes to the tune of really big damage awards uh, in federal court. So far, real courts of law have set back 79 campus guilty verdicts. One analyst notes that judges are losing patience with skewed college proceedings under Title IX. Brett? Doug, thank you. Well, some see President Trump as taking his first steps toward gun control. Others see this as somewhat of a head... To develop concrete steps that we can take to secure our schools, safeguard our students, and protect our communities. And just a few moments ago, I signed a memorandum directing the Attorney General to propose regulations to ban all devices that turn legal weapons into machine guns. We cannot merely take actions that make us feel like we are making a difference. We must actually make a difference. 
President Trump today uh, calling for a change in the rule on bump stocks. These are the additions uh, to guns used in the Las Vegas shooting, not in the Florida shooting, uh, to make it essentially, as the president said, a machine gun, an automatic weapon. The Justice Department, and there you see a picture uh, of that. The Justice Department releasing a statement. Um, the department understands this is a priority for the president and has acted quickly to move through the rulemaking process. We look forward to the results of that process as soon it's, as it's duly completed. We're understanding it's coming to an end. This as the Washington Post and ABC has a new poll out of, after the school shooting in Florida that says doing enough to prevent mass shootings. Congress at 19 percent, the president at 29 percent. Clearly, at least in the polls, there is a lot of momentum uh, to do more. Uh, let's bring in our panel, Steve Hayes, editor-in-chief of the Weekly Standard, Charles Lane, opinion writer for the Washington Post, and Charles Hurt, opinion editor for the Washington Times. Okay, it came as a bit of a surprise today. It didn't see it coming, the bump stock announcement. Um, this rule, what do you think it means, and what does it portend to the meetings ahead for this week? Well, I think it's hard to tell exactly what it means and where this broader debate is going. I mean, if you look back uh, before the new year, Republicans in Congress had considered taking some measures, measures like this legislatively and then opted not to. So I think the fact that the president stepped up suggests that there's um, consensus on the Republican side, or at least strong agreement on the Republican side, that, that this is something that ought to be looked at. I think in terms of the broader debate, Democrats are, you know, as they often do, complaining about the NRA, complaining about Republicans. Republicans. The media is obsessed with the argument that Republicans are controlled by the NRA. But really the problem, I think, is suggests if you're talking about an assault weapons ban or some of the more far-reaching um, efforts being discussed, the, the problem is really on the Democratic side. If you look back at the 2013 vote on the assault weapons ban, you had 15 Democrats who voted, uh, including some blue state Democrats, who voted uh, against the assault weapons ban. It was a 60-40 vote in a Senate that was controlled by Democrats. So Democrats at this point are the ones who are going to have to, if, if they want to start to win politically on this issue, they're going to have to start primarying Democrats who are voting with Republicans. On I mean, the issues. reason this is a rule and not Congress is because Congress didn't take it up. Congress didn't move forward. There was not like, even though a lot of people said after the Las Vegas shooting, this is the one to, to do around the edges. Uh, it's the president who's moving this ball. Well, yes. And I think that to your original question, what does it mean? It raises a question of how uh, substantial a rule it's really going to end up being because under the Obama administration it was thought within the ATF that there wasn't enough statutory authority to enact it by regulation which now President Trump is going to attempt to do and that tells me that somewhere down the line somebody's going to sue over this if it's not actually enacted into law so Senator Dianne Feinstein who, uh, Democrat of California is calling for a statute and I frankly don't understand why there shouldn't be a statute uh, unless maybe the only thing that's going on here is that President Trump is feeling under pressure over gun control and he's got to do something really quickly. Uh, I think Steve makes a very astute point, though, about the Democrats. There is a dilemma for them politically. Right now, there is a special election going on in western Pennsylvania, Trump country, uh, and the Democratic candidate for that seat is running as a pro-gun western Pennsylvania kind of Democrat. And in some of these red states, the Senate candidates on the Democratic side are torn as well. That is why, I'd say one of the many reasons I'm very skeptical substantial gun control will come out of this. Charlie? Well, that's always been the problem with uh, the accusation that, it, oh, these people are beholden to the NRA. The truth of the matter is, it's not that the people that the uh, politicians are beholden to the NRA, it's that they're beholden to voters who are, are like their gun rights and don't want to mess with. Um, of course, the, what, what is going on right now, any uh, bump stocks that were on shelves uh, after, uh, after the Las Vegas shooting are flying off the shelves right now. Um, one of the things I think a lot of people miss about uh, what people love about guns, they love the brilliant uh, mechanic ingenuity that goes into them. They're very, you know, they're very compl complex, uh, beautiful, uh, graceful machines. And that's how the bump stock came around. And so, as you point out, the questions will be how, you know, how broad is this? Uh, because, of course, whoever came up with the bump stock to begin with can easily uh, come up with something else that does the same thing. Um, and yeah, I think what that guy in Las Vegas loved about it was how it enabled him to kill 58 people. And I think that there, we're now reaching the point, I think what may be changing within the Democratic Party, too, is that this is really just, there's a level of outrage now. These slaughters and these massacres are just, if nothing else, is a national embarrassment. And I think the fact that President 
President Trump felt pressure to move shows that the beauty of the gun and the Second Amendment right is starting to lose its its hold a little bit at the margins. But the fact that it was so easy, an easy thing for, it wasn't a big gun company that came up with a bump stock. It was people that were uh, fiddling with guns, home, uh, uh, you know, modelists and stuff like that. And the point is that if, if people know how to do this sort of thing, other people can recreate it. Let's, let's look at the bigger picture here. And this week he's going to meet with us several different groups on the issue of gun control broadly and also stopping school shooting and increasing security at schools. Here is a Republican from Florida and Sarah Sanders today on the background check issue. We need to strengthen uh, Second Amendment rights for responsible gun owners, but we clearly have to do more to make sure guns stay out of the hands of those who want to harm innocent people. The president has expressed his support for efforts to improve the federal background check system, and in the coming days, we will continue to explore ways to ensure the safety and security of our schools. There's a growing interest. A lot of Republicans are saying yes. Uh, some of these changes are really common sense. So I guess it's just a different tone. It's it's a you haven't heard this kind of tone in a, I don't think ever. Um, no, I think there is there is a new tone. But look, I mean that that's pretty broad what they're saying. We're going to take a look at background checks. I mean we've have heard that before. We've heard that after every one of these. We're going to take a look at background checks. The, the question will be when you lay out the details of what the changes will be if we ever get to that point. Is it something that Republicans will embrace at that point? And as Charlie argues, is it something that gun owners across the country will embrace? And, uh, you know, the other thing is, I don't think anybody would disagree with the fact that we need to do more about, uh, uh, you know, more about making sure that people who shouldn't have guns are not allowed to get guns. The guy in, uh, in, in whether it's the guy in Las Vegas or, or this guy in Florida.